All right, Philippians chapter 1. The title of this message is called The Defense of the Gospel. And that phrase is in verses 7 and 17. I'm going to read um, verses 1 through um, 18 for the introductory reading. Taking a break still from our... um, Matthew series. Next weekend, uh, we're not meeting here. I'll be preaching in Kentucky. And then uh, the week after, we'll pick back up on something. Not sure what yet, but Philippians chapter 1 and verse 1 for the introductory reading. Paul and Timothy, the servants of Jesus Christ to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi with the overseers and deacons. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you always in every prayer of mine, making my request for you with all joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. Being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Even as it is righteous for me to think this of you all, because you have me in your heart inasmuch as both in my bonds... He was in prison at the time. And in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you are all partakers of my grace. For God is my witness how greatly I long after you in all bowels of Jesus Christ. And this I pray, that your love may abound yet more and more in full knowledge and in all perception that you may distinguish between things that differ and that you may be sincere and without offense until the day of Jesus Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness through Jesus Christ to the glory of His uh, and praise of God. But I desire that you should understand, brothers, that the things which happened to me have fallen out rather to the furtherance of the gospel so that my bonds in Christ are manifest or made known in the palace and in all other places. And most of the brothers in the Lord, becoming confident by my bonds, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some indeed preach Christ because of envy and strife, and some also of goodwill. Those indeed preach Christ out of contention, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my bonds. But these others preach in love, knowing that I am set for the defense of the gospel. What then? Nevertheless, in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached, and I rejoice in this yet also I will rejoice. I think it was about 17 years ago or so, um, we preached through the book of uh, Philippians verse by verse. It's been a long time. That's kind of a guesstimation. There's some old dusty cassette tapes, you know. Probably it was so long ago my voice was different. But um, the last couple years between our current verse-by-verse things that we're doing in certain series of messages, what I've sought to do is kind of lay down some foundational messages that I could refer people to when subjects, important vital subjects come up, and I could say, here, just listen to this message, rather than me having to re-preach a message through Messenger or an email or whatever. 
so that's kind of what's going on today with this message. Um, has to do always, of course, with the distinctions, that, the doctrinal distinctions that we hold to that, that, are, that match up with our confession of faith and our continual uh, propagation of the gospel here. So the subject of, of defending the gospel, for me, it was impressed upon me uh, day one of my conversion uh, to the gospel. And I saw um, during that time period why it was impressed upon me. I saw just compromise all over the place. I, was, I saw it from the get-go. I even you know, intellectually saw some of that before I was converted. You can, you know, people can see that to a certain extent in just like liberal theology. <clears throat> but um, since the defense of the faith is a vital part of the function of the church, um, this message is one of those reference messages that we can say, you know, what, what's the purpose of the church? It has many functions, but this is one function. And here, here's how you do that. You know, here's how you defend the gospel. Besides that, uh, it was so impressed upon me early on that um, um, I started titling some of the things that I wrote before, um, sometimes even before we even a church developed. Gospel Defense Ministries was the name of what I was involved with. And the website is gospeldefense.com. So I thought it would be good to explain what this means to defend the gospel. So, you know, in, in having that mindset throughout the years, I've run into several um, people that claim to hold to sovereign grace, Calvinistic reform doctrine and theology, and they would say, you know, that, that idea of gospel defense is kind of negative, you know? I've heard that a lot. I don't know if you guys have ever heard that. And what that means to me, knowing what I know now, is that's code language for, that's offensive. <laughs> I think that's exactly what that means. Um, so, in other words, it shows that they're kind of clueless, clueless about this biblical idea of what the Scripture talks about, the, the offense of the cross. So let's go right into this. Um, point number one is only God's justified elect can identify as saints. So we want to introduce the subject here by looking at verse 1 and seeing who... Um, Paul and Timothy, Paul includes Timothy in this. A lot of times I think Paul would say what he was going to say and somebody else would write it for him. But either way, this is under the inspiration of the Spirit. Verse 1, Paul and Timothy, the servants of Jesus Christ, notice, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi. This was the location where this church was. And notice who is he's also writing to, with the overseers, plural, and the deacons, plural. I didn't do any research about how big this church was as far as the need for a plurality of elders and deacons. have no idea. Um, I would think they're probably bigger than our group, this Church of Philippi. I would think so. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. So this letter is to believers only, as all the New Testament letters are, believers only. Those that are justified and sanctified. In other words, those that have been regenerated by the power of the Holy Spirit and been given God-given faith and God-given repentance towards God. And we spoke many times of, of this idea of what a saint is. You have all kind of weird religious connotations, uh, false connotations about what a saint is. A lot of people think that this is something that you eventually attain to progressively. And uh, in some, like in Rome, um, Catholicism, it's like you, you don't even never know until you die. And then this, uh, some committee or something decides and makes people votes. I don't know how they do it some form of uh, 
democracy sainthood based on the judgment of somebody else, I guess. Depend on how well you did in your life. But here, uh, he addresses all these believers as saints. And um, they're identified as, as ones who God makes known to them and others this point, this fact, this truth that he has set them apart. So he, he makes that known to them and to others about them that they have been set apart to the Lord and to the truth of the gospel. The word saints you know, refers to being sanctified or holy, which again means set apart. And we've laid down several times that um, God has wisely purposed to use His gospel as a means in salvation. You know, the gospel is the power of God into salvation, Romans 1.16. Very basic, God uses means to save His people. So this sets kind of the tone uh, for the reminder that when He calls these people saints and then He says grace and peace to them, and he's only talking to believers when he says grace and peace. Kind of sets the tone in the in the remainder of the the concerning the gospel in the context here of this letter of the utility, or, or in other words, usefulness of the gospel in the life of the believer. Uh, in in general evangelical religion, I think there's this idea of people using the gospel what they consider the gospel is this initiation and then you don't use it anymore. It's your ticket to get in and then after that you don't really look at the gospel, you don't talk about the gospel, you look at the rest of the Christian life and the practical things and you leave the gospel behind. But the more that you study the scriptures, the more you see the value of the utility of the gospel every day and the importance of the gospel in the everyday life of the believer. You cannot live the Christian life without using the gospel in it as a platform and a basis. We also know that just some general statements here about the gospel. Without faith in the gospel, nobody can even lay claim to any promises of God. You can't, without faith, you can't say any promises are directed toward you. We can also say the same thing about spiritual blessings. There are no spiritual blessings received because you receive things by faith. No spiritual blessings received outside of God-given faith. And we know, of course, the Scripture says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. And we say, we talk about faith in a, in a more distinct way than the majority of so-called Christianity does because they look at it that it's self-derived, out of their will, and most of them identify their faith as the righteousness that makes them acceptable. Of course, you know, that's that's what we were that's what we've been converted out of. We don't believe that we've been given repentance from our old faith and even from our repentance. So we now we have a repentance that doesn't need repented of <laughs> and a faith that looks outside of ourselves to the object of faith, which is our assurance the Lord Jesus Christ. Secondly, the church function and value of gospel fellowship. Look at verse 3. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, making my request for you in uh, you all with joy. What for, Paul? Why do you do that for? For your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. So the, the church, the, in other words, the, the unity of the church body of gathered believers, we said earlier, has many different functions. 
And the gospel has many different uses. And here we see those two things merge. The functions of the church and the utility of the gospel, and they meet right here. Now it's obvious that um, a person who is gathered or assembled with others is partly, of course, to fellowship in this gospel. And to do that, a person must be able to identify the gospel to fellowship in it, right? I mean, people just don't show up and like, you know, this is a traditional thing to do and it's a trendy thing to do and I feel obligated to go to church, you know? And you show up, okay, why are we here, right? And I guess different denominations have different reasons why they're there. Each group has their hobby horse they talk about and they glory in. And um, they do different things to um, gain and maintain members. And um, it's just, uh, it's, it's all, over the, all over the place. I did a video on this whiteboard and uh, uploaded it last night called Bad Religion. And I list a bunch of things that some people might gather together and focus on in so-called churches and fellowship in, and really none of it has to do with the gospel. So we have to be able to identify the gospel to fellowship in it. And thirdly, the third point is identification of the gospel includes a definition of it. So the next few minutes, I will kind of want to um, kind of grind on this idea of, of, of what the gospel is, which we talk about in, in different facets and many different angles every week in whatever text we're looking at. And a person can, um, any believer can at any given time give variations of definitions, a multiplicity of def definitions of the same gospel. They can give short definitions, they can give broad definitions. You know, I mean, this is the idea. When we come and teach and fellowship in the gospel, we talk about it in many different ways, you know, in many different, whether it's an elementary way, a simple, a clear way, or it's a deeper way that maybe includes particulars and implications. You know, it's so vast that uh, we, we can never run out of things to talk about concerning the gospel. So as I define this, uh, of course, there are always going to be people that may be on the outside listening that said, look, he forgot that, you know. The gospel is God's promise of complete salvation and acceptance in Christ alone. How? By His doing and dying to accomplish that salvation for His chosen people. In that gospel, we know, is the righteousness of God revealed. And what does that do? That clearly displays the merit of Christ's righteousness as He obeyed the law and as He paid the penalty of the broken law. That's what I mean when I say His doing and dying. And that was to fully satisfy the justice of the law. And he did that as a substitute, a representative, a mediator, and a surety. To put away the sins of his people by his own sinless sacrifice. And this effectual work by Christ results in him, what's called establishing a perfect righteousness, which is legally charged or transferred or imputed to the account of his people, his sheep, his elect, his chosen. And because of the success of that work, that perfect work by Christ, <clears throat> because of that success, we, we call it a perfect work, a sufficient work, he remained sinless, flawless. He finished the work. He satisfied God in that work, satisfied the law. We consider that 
all those terms overall to be an acceptable sacrifice, acceptable to the Father who it was towards. And because of that, because it was acceptable, Christ was victoriously resurrected from the dead. And he did that to vindicate or to justify who he is and who his Father is in his glory in accomplishing that work. And as Christ was set forth by the Father in the glory of that work to accomplish it, he was shown to be worthy of being exalted, and he was exalted. He died, was buried, was raised, and he was uh, he ascended and he was exalted on high in the highest position of honor and preeminence that can ever be held in this by anybody in this age or any age to come in the future. And what this does, as we see him high and lifted up and we understand this gospel, whoever is given faith to believe this gospel, we see that it, what it does is it completely excludes the best works of sinful human beings and it automatically excludes all boasting and bragging and pride and self-righteousness in this salvation of God's free and sovereign grace conditioned on Christ. And this is the only way, this gospel that God has wisely decreed and purposed and, and made manifest, and Christ, of course, performed and accomplished, is the only way that God can show to be both a God of justice and a loving Savior at the same time. Justice and mercy meet together. They agree. Scripture in Psalms says that they kiss. They agree and are honored in a way that can enable God himself to be, to be justified when he justifies his people by the righteousness of Christ alone. And we know that it was eternally purposed it was accomplished in time and finished, and it's applied in time to those for whom it was for. All of God's lost sheep will be found by their great shepherd. They'll be brought to him by faith. They'll be safe and secure. And in all that, they will never be cast out or ever perish, ever, never. So we know, as we look at that, we see that the Lord God Almighty cannot and will not fail to accomplish His full and free salvation for His people. So this is the gospel that God's people know and they can identify and they fellowship in. And notice it says, Paul says about these people, from the first day until now. Since the first day that they were converted, believing this gospel, they fellowshiped in it. They enjoyed fellowship in it. Uh, to the point that Paul, he heard about it. There were reports about this, that this was what was going on at the church of Philippi. And this is, this is the way it should be. I mean, this is a, uh, we see this in these New Testament churches, and this should be the pattern as as Paul communicates and other apostles communicate about the way the church should function, this is a key element of a good, healthy, functioning church is fellowship in the gospel. It should be a gospel-driven church in reference to purpose. So again, in other words, the gospel is not only used as a means in reference to cause one to come to Christ initially, by the power of the Spirit, but it's, again, utilized in, in our everyday lives, not just the meeting of the church, however many times a week, but in our lives, in our daily lives, when we're not assembled together, as we're moving and breathing and um, have this treasure in earthen vessels in a mobile fashion, and we live by faith, 
the gospel must be utilized and able to think properly. And it is our, as I've said a million times, it's our filter and funnel by which we interpret even the scripture itself. And as we see and learn and uh, we teach other things, we teach it in light of the gospel that we already know and that we grow in. So, it's to be used from the day that we are converted till the day we die. Now, having said that, this gospel is not just used for that in reference to the church, in fellowshipping together in the church, but it is also used in our, in our own communion and, and fellowship with God Himself. Because it's a constant reminder of everything about who he is and who we are in relationship to one another. So in other words, we, we actually know him through the use of the gospel. John 17, 3, we always quote it, you know, this is life eternal that you may know him, the only true God in Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. So in the context, it, it shows the importance of this idea that I just mentioned in the next verse. Verse 6, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. So first of all, Paul talks about the gospel. He talks about these people you're known for fellowshipping in the gospel. And... Um, Every time I think of you to pray about you, I, I remember that and, and realize that, acknowledge that. And you've done it from the day you've been converted until now. And he reminds them he's confident, not necessarily in them, of course. It's not what he's talking about. He's talking about the way this works, he's saying, that whoever God has done this for, shown them the gospel, revealed it to them, and worked in him this truth, that he started, which goes back to what he said about till the first day until now, as he writes this letter, he says it's going to go on until the end. This is the way that it works. That's why he said being confident of this very thing. He's not talking about confidence in their flesh. He's confident in, in, in the, the one that's working, who is God. So in other words, he's assuring them that if they are believers, that they will not stop believing this gospel. They will persevere. That's what perseverance means. They won't stop. They'll continue to go. And they will not apostatize. Or in other words, they won't leave it. They'll continue to believe it. So God's elect when justified and sanctified will and I'm going to quote part of a verse that we looked at the last few weeks, continue in the faith grounded and settled and will not be moved away from the hope of the gospel. Recognize that probably from Colossians 1.23, first half of that verse. And also, this is an idea from 2 John 2. Um, verse 9 they will not, God's people that are believers, will not transgress the doctrine of Christ, but rather they will abide in it. In other words, they'll stay in it and persevere in the doctrine of Christ. So this is really saying the same thing that what Paul's saying in Philippians 1 there. So have we seen yet that God's people are not... At the very least, they're not gospel dummies, right? The gospel has been powerfully revealed to God's people. They're not ignorant of the gospel. Because if you're ignorant of the gospel, it automatically means, and we look at it all the time, Romans 1, or I'm sorry, Romans 10, 1 through 4, that the result of being ignorant of the gospel is to automatically go about to establish a righteousness of your own, which is you know, a false gospel. So he, 
He sovereignly and effectually causes them to know, understand, agree, trust, believe, love, and grow in the truth that has set them free. So not only that, next we'll see the fourth point. God causes his people to defend the gospel. Verse 7. Even as it is righteous for me to think this of you all, because you have me in your heart, it means, it means you're thinking about me, is what Paul's telling them, inasmuch as in my bonds when he's in prison and also outside of prison, not that he's not defending the gospel in prison, but he spent a lot of time traveling and, and propagating the gospel everywhere that he went as an apostle. And in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you are all partakers of my grace. So Paul was used as a means to get the gospel out. He's considered the apostle to the Gentiles. And, um, you know, he, he also preached to Jews, but... This is the guy that took up the gospel by grace, by the power of God, to propagate it all over the place. So much so that he was always getting in trouble. He was getting beat up. He was being imprisoned and so on. But he's talking about here something that he did um, concerning the defense and the confirmation of the gospel. Now, the word defense means a plea, or to answer for something. And it comes from a word that means to give an account in regards to like a legal defense or a, or a reasoning or an answer. And the Greek word, um, and I'm, I'm not famous for pronouncing Greek words, neither do I think it's necessary in all circumstances, but sometimes I'll pronounce them to remind you of things that we already know about and can relate to and with that we've already talked about. And the Greek word is apologia, and, um, which may sound familiar because it's one of the functions of the church, which is called apologetics. It just means a defense of the faith. Now, when we talk about that, I'm always careful to um, tell people, especially that, that don't listen or haven't heard or are familiar with uh, our ministry, that we also take just a time out to ensure that we talk about the particular method, biblical method, which I think is the only biblical method of the defense of the faith, which is called presuppositional which just simply means that we presuppose that whatever God says is truth because he tells us in his word that he will not and cannot lie to his people. In other words, um, but with that being said, let me say this first. With that being said, his truth is revealed to his people in the scripture, the, the use of the means of the scripture, by the power of the Holy Spirit, leading them into truth, but don't forget this, with an understanding. With an understanding. Now, I mean, we trust that in presupposing that we believe whatever God says is true, we already know and trust because He said that He will, as He reveals, He will give us an understanding in revealing the truth to us. In other words, I'm saying that in fighting against this idea of mysticism, of faith is a blind leap into the dark, and it's irrational, right? God gives us an understanding when he reveals the truth to us. So that comes with this method of apologetics. In other words, the Holy Spirit teaches God's people through 
the doctrine that's contained in the scripture. It's almost redundant. He teaches with doctrine. Doctrine is teaching. But a lot of people um, have used the word doctrine as a curse word, like it's something to be avoided. We know better than that. So we live and walk by God-given faith. The just shall live by faith. We don't walk by sight. That's what the natural, carnal, worldly, the worldly wisdom, the ways of the world, the, 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 the flesh would live by sight. And this is the one, when I say flesh or carnal or whatever, the natural mind, this is the one that is a mind that has not yet been given spiritual life, the one that's dead in trespasses and sins. And we know this is the case because this type of mind cannot receive the things of the Spirit because spiritual things are spiritually understood. And the natural mind can't do that because of the state that they're in of total depravity. Now, let me um, note something here before we go any further because it's starting to get into some, um, some areas here in our text that start to become twisted. And I just want to lay out some, some caveats. Um, you cannot grow in a gospel that you don't believe. And you cannot believe a gospel that you don't know and understand. I don't know how anybody... People will attempt to get past that and try to say, we're done. <laughs> I don't know how you can get past that. I mean, I think these are, these are facts that make biblical sense. If you look at those things I just said, and they're throughout the tone of the whole Scripture. You can't grow in a gospel you don't believe, and you can't believe in a gospel you don't know and understand. So what I'm getting at is a person must have life before they grow, right? I'm talking about the spiritual life. I'm talking about justification in life. So they can't... Um, that's just, a, that's just a contradiction to say otherwise. So when a person grows in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, it doesn't mean that they didn't know and understand the gospel yesterday. If they believe one day and they grow that day or the next day, it doesn't mean they didn't understand or know the gospel yesterday. What it means simply is that they know and understand it better and more than they did yesterday. That's what growth is. So in, in short, the, the true gospel is the, we know it's the power of God and the salvation, which means we don't start out in a false gospel as baby Christians holding to a false gospel and then eventually grow into the true gospel. That, that's not the case. You can't grow if you're dead. And if you're in a false gospel, you're dead, spiritually. You have to have life before you can grow. You have to have the true gospel in connection with life. So to say that you, you start out in a false gospel and you're considered a baby Christian, really, I think we can prove from the Scripture that that lie is the furthest thing from the truth from the actual defense of the gospel. It is not defending the gospel if you say that. It is actually to, to be an abomination and bringing glory to the lie of the serpent in the spirit of Antichrist. So we're talking about defense and confirmation. The word confirmation has to do with stability uh, to establish and it brings the idea of, of something that stands, right? You could talk about a lot of things in the Scripture. You could talk about God Himself. You can talk about the truth. 
And you can talk about believers, and you can have this idea in there of something that stands, that's stable, and that's established, right? And they all kind of converge and, and mesh together. We can look at them separately for study, but there's the idea that, um, of course, God, who is the one who is the main one standing and is the foundation, he uses his word to establish us or cause us to stand. And then that word, that gospel is used throughout our life and then in fellowship, and we use it to build each other up. This is this idea of always there's talk about buildings and foundations and stuff not um, falling apart, which means there's consistency and strength. You talk about something that's in, you know, the truth is consistent because when you start talking about something and it doesn't stick together, it's not consistent. It kind of loses its definition as being true, right? I mean, you've seen in court, you know, the, the testimony doesn't stick together. It's inconsistent. It falls apart. And we know what the jury is going to say and the judge is going to say. It's not going to work. <clears throat> so we see the vital importance of defending the gospel here because it displays God's glorious character attributes. It shows who He is, right? Showing who He is is the way that we see and know God. We learn about His character, His, His grace, His mercy, His justice, His righteousness, His wrath, His... Um, all these character attributes, his, his knowledge, his wisdom, all these things about God. We could go on and on and on. The gospel is connected to that. It's not to be divorced from it. The gospel protects the character of God, displays the character of God, shows off the character of God, makes manifest or makes known the character of God. It's really the main tool that's used to do that. That's why it's convenient and important to fellowship in that gospel. So we continue to use it as a means for um, growth, for assurance, for fellowship, for worship, and many other things. Look at verse 8. For God is my witness, how greatly I long after you in the bowels of Jesus Christ. And that idea of bowels is talking about an inward affection tied to tender mercy. That's the idea there. And this I pray that, notice, your love, which of course is very important. Love is talked about throughout the scripture. Your love may abound a little bit. More and more. I mean, the word by itself abound means some form of mathematical increase, right? But more and more. <clears throat> How? In the full knowledge and in all perception. Notice here when <laughs> Paul's using this language, he's clearly not promoting uh, ignorance and mysticism. Full knowledge and in all perception. <clears throat> These are purposed words that he's using. He goes on to say, that you may what? Distinguish between things that differ. I think this is a very um, hidden and overlooked line that not many, many people talk about. He talks about the importance here. He's just talking about truth, getting to the bottom of the truth by making distinctions about the truth that God has given us. He wants everybody to have a full knowledge and perception so that they can distinguish between things that differ. That you may be sincere and without offense until the day of Jesus Christ. The rest of your life, in other words. Again, perseverance in the truth of the gospel. Using distinctions as a method 
for plainness of speech, going as far as using the antithesis to show a contrast and a distinction of truth and lie. Being filled, verse 11, with the fruits of righteousness through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. So the gospel is a message when revealed to us by the power of the Spirit, it has an effect. It has an effect in our mind. And at that point, of course, we know that God is, is working in us both to will and to do of His good pleasure and fruit is born. We bear it. We don't produce it. The Spirit produces fruit. We bear it, and then other believers can see and relate to, because we fellowship in the same gospel. So the gospel of grace has an effect in the hands of the Spirit of God in the lives of believers. Verse 12, But I desire that you should understand, brothers, that the things which happened to me have fallen out, rather for the furtherance of the gospel. He's saying, look, you know, I'm in prison, um, and, and because of that, I don't want you to think of this idea that we would normally think in some type of a strategic worldly event, like, I'm in jail, it's over, I lost, I failed. It's not that. Paul's saying, uh, you know, God does things the way he does. Our, his thoughts are not our thoughts, his ways are not our ways. He will do different things, and, and here's one example before we go any further. It's kind of related that there would be um, a couple groups that have maybe come together or, or maybe a, an original group that is split that really does believe the gospel, and maybe they are um, split over a secondary issue or something, or... Maybe just like somebody was just not acting right, and one just, I, I can't take it anymore. You know, Paul separated, uh, was it Mark, I think? And, and, you know, later on got back together. So these things happen, persecution happens, people flee, and wherever they go, wherever God's people go, in other words, then the gospel's developed there. No matter what the reason of why they travel, where they travel, the gospel is spread. And God decides where that is, when that is, how that works. Paul, you know, other areas, people might have some ideas like, hey, I want to spread the gospel. Well, Paul said, I'm going to go to Asia. The Spirit wouldn't let him go. So this is just further proof that God is in charge of wherever the gospel goes, how effective it is. One plants, one waters, but God gives the increase. And no matter what, wherever the word goes out, it won't go out void. It goes for a purpose. It either does one of two things. It hardens or it converts. And the Spirit of God does that, not those that deliver it. We're just responsible to preach the gospel. It's, it's, it takes a while to kind of get all that in your mind and, and have your mind right, you know, we might have friends and family and coworkers or whatever that we have preached the gospel to over and over and progressively gotten clearer and clearer and more distinct and more bold, and they don't believe it. And if we th get to a certain point and think, you know what? And, and maybe they're not freaking out about it. Maybe they're not resistant, but they're just not believing it. They're not hostile. Some people might say, I just don't think that that person is elect. I think they're a reprobate. Scripture doesn't tell us to think that. We're not, we're not, that's not our business to think that way. God will save all his people and he'll do it when he wants. And he goes on to say, you know, he's, he's pointing this out. This is not a failure really in God's purpose. I mean, if, if we know anything about God's absolute sovereignty, we know that 
there's no failure in what goes down and the way God wants it to work. <clears throat> it goes on in verse 13, it says, So that my bonds in Christ, him being in prison in Christ, are manifest or made known uh, in, the, in the palace. Word got out to the authorities, wherever the king or whatever type of form of government was, it got out, hey, you know, this Paul guy that's preaching this gospel that's stirring up quite a stir, and a lot of people are believing this gospel. He, this Paul guy, he's in prison. The palace people heard about it. And more than likely, not just that rumor or that eventual fact about that, but the message connected to it. They put this guy in prison, what, what's he saying, you know? Well, the gospel, you know, reached the palace. That's what he's talking about, the furtherance of the gospel. Verse 14, And most of the brothers in the Lord, becoming confident by my bonds, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Well, that's a good thing, right? Verse 15, Some indeed even preach Christ because of envy and strife, and some... The other, the other people also of goodwill. Now, what I want us to notice here, before we go any further, is both groups of these two contrasting groups are preaching the true Christ. It doesn't say this one group that's kind of got a weird motive, they're preaching a false gospel, a false Christ, and this other one, they've they got a good motive, they're preaching the true Christ. No. What's bad is their method and motive but what's good is the same gospel. They're just preaching it with different attitudes. Okay? I've seen people run to this text here and try to say, um, try to defend a false gospel or tolerate a false gospel by saying, see, look, it says here that these different people are, are, um, uh, are preaching really two different messages. You know, they're both preaching Christ. Otherwise, Paul wouldn't say, preaching Christ. And I say that because of the other things he's written on the inspiration of the Holy Spirit are very clear that he would not compromise in that manner by thinking that. Verse 16, those indeed preach Christ out of contention, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my bonds. Could have, could have... <laughs> First of all, do we realize that saints are sinners? Um, you know, Paul in some of his other writing, and Peter and some of the other apostles say, hey, to the church, hey, quit hating each other. <laughs> stop doing this. Stop saying this. Stop backbiting. Stop lying to one another. Stop hating one another. Put off these deeds. Now, why would he say that if a, if a true believer couldn't do that? And, and Paul knew himself in Romans 7. He said, man, I'm, I'm just dragging around this body of death. Every time I want to do something good, I've got evil with me. So was, was this a good thing in and of itself concerning the attitude of the envy and strife? No, it was sin. But what overrode that is the truth that came out of the lips of these sinners who were preaching the true gospel. Now, you know, you can say that and you can stop and say, looks like it's a good thing, so it doesn't matter what our attitude is. You know, well, you just go ahead and tear out the second half of every letter of the New Testament because it will instruct you otherwise. For sure. We know this. So it talks about preaching Christ out of a contention. But the idea is Christ, it says that they do preach Christ. But these others, verse 17, preach in love. There's the model that we should follow. There's the pattern that we should follow, that the apostles and Christ taught that we should follow. They preach in love knowing that I am... Here's the, the second phrase. The first one was in verse 7, defense and confirmation. Here's the second 
second statement here, knowing that I am set for the defense of the gospel. Same context, mentioned it twice. It must be pretty important. The word set means uh, appointed. Now, we know that, that Paul, of course, was appointed in a, an authoritative way in, with apostolic authority, right? That idea doesn't stop there. We know that um, those that preach and teach in this world, pastors, teachers, elders, bishops, and deacons, and so on, that teach, uh, and, and others that even preach and teach that don't have an official um, office of that, anybody that preaches, and I'm going to extend it to every believer that teaches and <clears throat> witnesses, bears record, bears testimony of Christ, propagates the gospel, in other words, is set for the defense of the gospel. They're appointed for the defense of the gospel. Every believer is, to a certain extent. He goes on in verse um, 18. What then? Nevertheless, in every way, whether in pretense or in truth. And when he says in truth, don't get this wrong. He's referring to in truth concerning like sincerity. Right? True sincerity. He's not pitting truth against a lie. He's talking about the person's attitude that he just talked about contrasting the two groups. Nevertheless, in every way, whether in pretense, and it's talking about the method and the attitude and the motive, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached. These people with a bad attitude that are preaching the truth, Christ is preached. And the people that are doing it with a right attitude and love, Christ is preached. And he says, I rejoice in this. He said, bottom line, the idea is the gospel's getting out. Yet also, I will rejoice. And so, in other words, in a nutshell, he's not saying, I'm tolerating the false gospel, and I don't care what doctrine gets out there and what's taught. Just, just use Jesus' name and make up the rest. I'm just glad Jesus' name is mentioned a couple times. He's not talking about that. He's talking about the gospel that these people fellowshiped in that was the tool to use as we live and walk by faith and fellowship in, have assurance in, use as the basis concerning the platform of our worship and anything that we do as far as works or whatever. It's important. It's important not to pervert it because we see in other books, he flat out said, hey, if the gospel is twisted, then it's, um, it's, you're, you're going to be condemned. You're going to be cursed. It's not a game. We could go on and on and on about the defense of the gospel, but I think the idea is realizing things in like different layers, like the gospel. Uh, we, we talked about how it has to be true before it to be considered even the gospel itself. So we, we see the gospel has to be true. We, got, we know God uses that one and only gospel as the power of God unto salvation initially. So we believe that gospel, and that gospel has continued to be used throughout our life for everything, growth. Um, and when I say growth, I'm not talking about just growth in our Christian life. I'm talking about growth in the same gospel, about the gospel, and about everything in the gospel, the personal work of Christ. So we grow in more and more about who He is and what He has done to accomplish this salvation that we have. And, um, you know, we have it for our assurance, our peace, our joy. And again, everything that we teach, I don't care what it is. I don't care if it's marriage uh, or, or whatever. We teach it in light of the gospel, related to the gospel. We use the gospel itself for an interpretational tool of everything we read in the scripture. Um, 
we are told to walk worthy of the gospel, which um, we see examples of people when they're maybe compromising the gospel. It is said that they're not walking uprightly according to the gospel. Now, what's that person going to say? What are you talking about, gospel? I mean, I used the gospel at first. I don't need it anymore. No. Look, right now, every day, you have to walk worthy and uprightly according to that gospel. In other words, it's, it, it gives consistency in your thought in your Christian life. Besides, uh, I mean, we had mentioned that it, it, it displays the character of God. And if, if you claim to worship this only true God, and this message is the best thing to magnify and display the character of God, do you see the value in it? If you see the value in it, that means you love it. And if you love it, you're going to defend it. Any comments or questions? Let me add one more thing. As you defend the gospel, here Paul gave a contrast with two different type of people that had two different type attitudes. As we defend the gospel, we're to have the attitude of this uh, second category of people. In love, we are to love, patience, compassion, and so on. Um, not using words of wisdom, not talking over people's heads, not beating them up with it, not acting like we're the know-it-all and they're a bunch of dummies because we soon forget where we came from. I mean, we've, we talk about this all the time. I'm just saying, when we defend the gospel, we need to do it in the right way.